In this lesson, we look at incident management and the activities in each phase. I step through an actual incident to show how the process works. Before jumping into incident management, we need to be clear about what an incident actually is. There are two kinds of things that can occur to information resources, an event and an incident. An event is anything that can be measured within your environment. Events constantly occur across a healthy network. An event is something that is planned or expected and so should already have management processes in place. An incident is an unexplained, unplanned occurrence that happens on your network that negatively impacts an IT system or potentially has a negative impact on a system or violates or presents an imminent threat of violating a security policy or procedure. The primary objectives of an incident response process are to contain and remediate a threat and its associated business impact. The process used to manage an incident consists of seven steps or phases, which are detection, response, mitigation, reporting, recovery, remediation, and lessons learned. So let's step through the incident management process by using a simulated incident. An attacker installs a worm on a payroll user desktop attached to VLAN 10. Our organization has several methods for detecting the malware and its activities. These methods include log management, a SIM, and intrusion detection and prevention capabilities. The security team detected the worm with activity alerts on the SIM portal. Once a potential incident is detected, triage must be performed. Incidents are divided into two major categories, human verified incidents and just convincing false positives. Not all incidents have the same risk associated with them. Other alerts popped up with this one, but the worm is considered the highest priority. We declared a high priority incident and we now enter the response step. Response begins with following the section of the incident response plan that deals with this type of incident. All responses have some actions in common, beginning with investigation. Investigation includes identifying the specific threat and how it is affecting the network and systems. This leads to understanding how to contain and eradicate the threat. Another important response activity is assessing the business impact of the incident. For example, if the incident affects delivery of goods or services, senior management must be informed. In incidents in which insider threats might be involved, interviews are needed. This includes speaking with anyone who can provide information about who, what, when, where, how, and why. Interviews can also help understand business impact. And finally, the team performs actions designed to quickly reduce business impact. In our example, this would likely be disconnecting the payroll computer from the network. These steps do not always have to take place in order. For example, knowing that a computer is infected with a worm, we wouldn't wait very long until we disconnected it from the network. One action often taken if we plan to prosecute an attacker or insider is evidence collection. If this is required, we must begin immediately after starting response to preserve crucial evidence. All actions during the initial response stages and throughout the response, including a collection of any evidence, must be thoroughly documented, including summary of the incident, indicators of compromise, origins of the attack, observable changes to the files or functions of the affected system, details about the malware, conversations with other teams and stakeholders, all notes and documents collected, a list of evidence gathered, chains of custody, impact assessments, current status and next steps, and contact information for all stakeholders. If it appears that a crime was committed and the organization will seek prosecution, law enforcement should be notified as soon as possible. 
This helps with the collection and preservation of evidence. Now comes mitigation. By this phase of the response, all the right people are working on the incident. The first activity in this step is full containment. Containment restricts the scope of the attack and reduces business impact. Mitigation includes containing the threat. We have two ways to do this in this attack. We can unplug the infected computer, which we've already done, but this is a worm. We can also use predefined configurations to isolate the segment on which the worm resides. I know the CISSP CBK says that containment is done in the mitigation step, but we don't have to wait that long. Personally, I would have isolated VLAN 10 as soon as I knew there was a worm roaming. Because there are other devices on the segment, and this is a worm, the team chooses to be safe and isolate VLAN 10. During mitigation and throughout the incident response process, it is critical to ensure confidentiality and integrity. Containment should be restricted when possible to mitigate business impact due to lack of resource availability. The team has already done an initial business impact assessment. However, now having known everything and taken complete containment steps, the team has to determine the length of time until the return of full business process capabilities. If the time to recovery might exceed one or more business process maximum tolerable downtimes, disaster recovery, or other business continuity procedures might have to be initiated. In this incident, only the payroll clerk and the HR clerk are affected. This prevents the payroll process from operating. However, the IR team believes they can restore operation before the maximum tolerable downtime is reached. After the mitigation step, the IR team knows enough about the incident to determine if a breach occurred. The team does not have to wait until now to report a breach if a system or data compromise is identified earlier. There are two types of incident reporting, internal and external. Internal reporting includes informing senior managers and C-level executives about what is discovered, the potential impact, and any downtime of business processes. Reporting to C-level executives is only necessary if the incident is severe and will have a significant business impact. For example, it might be required to interrupt business operations to the point where disaster recovery procedures are initiated. In our case, if payroll could not be met because the worm infected the payroll system on the day that payroll was being processed, C-level executives and senior management would certainly have to be notified. Reporting also includes communicating regularly throughout the incident with other IT teams and with the IR team's immediate supervisors. External reporting requirements depend somewhat on the legal environment and the statutes under which the organization falls. For example, if PII is stolen, there may be state or federal requirements to report the incident. Reporting also includes informing customers or business partners if there is an interruption in delivering goods and services. Notifying investors of the incident and what is being done to resolve it may also be necessary. When an incident results in the interruption of one or more business processes, the recovery step is needed. In this step, the appropriate teams perform the tasks necessary to return all processes to normal operation. Many recovery steps should already be defined in the business continuity plan and its disaster recovery subplans. During recovery, business operations may be restored in stages. Only two devices on the segment were infected. The team re-imaged them. Once the worm was eliminated, connectivity was restored to the VLAN segment. Remediation is the return of all business processes and the underlying technology to the state before the incident. Since recovery can be graduated, the final step of the recovery achieves remediation. In this step, fines or fees are also paid to regulators or affected parties. This might also include settlements to customers. After remediation, we enter the lessons learned step. One of the essential activities in this step is the root cause analysis. It seeks to answer what happened, why did it happen, and how to prevent it from happening again. 
The teams involved in the response also determine how the response process was executed and identify opportunities for improvement. This requires reviewing all documentation created during the incident. I have led response teams over the years. Teams need to respond to the unexpected and the requirements of the moment. Do not think that you have to follow these steps and the related activities in order. Instead, treat the steps as guidelines when creating your response plans. That's it for this lesson. If you have questions, please ask. And as always, be careful what you click.